Okay, so actually I, I went ahead and put in the playlist two videos in a row. So the first one that was linked in the playlist was this one that showed you how um, the baby reacted when their mom left the room. And this was a securely attached baby. And you see the, um, the stranger attempting to comfort the baby. And it's just not doing it for the baby. They want their mom and their mom calms them down. In the next video, you saw what it looks like when you have an ambivalently attached infant who and actually this child looks a little bit more than 24 months old um, but you've got a child who um, is not necessarily looking at their parent as uh, they want them to be a safe place but they are the parent isn't giving them what they need or um, something has gone wrong in that attachment so that the child is now ambivalent about their relationship with their in this case mom um, a lot of the research almost all of the research initially was on moms and their children um, ultimately it has expanded out to explore dads grandparents um, caregivers of all types and the key thing that we want to drive home now is that as long as a child is securely attached to someone then it helps them to move into the next level of being able to have good relationships when they get older. So um, one of the things I just wanted, I thought I had it outlined, but apparently I don't. Um, one of the things that's really important to think about when we think about attraction and, and love styles and things like that is that um, people who had a, a securely attached relationship with someone when they were in those very formative years, you know, the zero to 24 month period, um, tend to have a more trusting approach to the world. And so when they have the opportunity to enter into love relationships or friendships even, in fact, what we find is that securely attached toddlers tend to grow up to be children, you know, between eight and 12 who have um, more enduring friendships, um, you know, more um, satisfying friendships. And then when they get into their adolescent years and start looking at, you know, adolescence is really marked by a lot of loyalty from our friends. We really expect that from our friends when we're teenagers and uh, children who are securely attached are able to be more trusting of their friendships in adolescence and can be more authentic in those. And then also uh, adolescence is marked by, you know, the entry into interest in the other sex, right? Or into sexual relationships and, and um, you know, romantic relationships. And so um, we see that children who are securely attached in toddlerhood um, tend to grow up to be people who um, in adolescence and beyond can have more, um, you know, authentic relationships with romantic partners as well. So there seems to be a long term benefit to having secure attachments when you're an infant. Um, the one thing I'm going to give you as a caveat is that recent researchers have been suggesting that um, that early attachment isn't as important as we once thought um, in the way that oh good, I've got a securely attached child, they're probably going to have a securely attached romantic relationship in their 30s. I mean, like it's not that directly correlated. It just appears that that basic trust is more pronounced in a person who is securely attached to their parents. All right, so what are some of the determinants of attraction? Well, one of the biggest determinants of who we find attractive is who we're around, right? We call that proximity. Um, so one of the things that I like to do in class is I pass out this really stupid handout where it's just got every letter of the alphabet presented in random order. And you're supposed to rate each of the word, each of the letters on a scale from one to, I don't like it at all, to five. I like it a lot, right? And what they tend to find is that, um, people who have, um, people tend to rate the, the, their initials like whatever your first initials are, um, more highly than other letters of the alphabet. And we think that might be due to familiarity. So one of the things that proximity can do for us is breed familiarity. You know, if you see that same person every day, or you see that same person, um, you know, in, in your homeroom in high school or in your, um, you know, psychology class at school or something, if you see them, you know, frequently, you have proximity to them, they become more familiar to you. And familiarity breeds attraction. Like why else would a person rate the first initial of their name more highly than other letters in the alphabet? There's no rhyme or reason to it. Um, if you ask a person, they'll oftentimes say, oh, well, I like the shape of it, or I like the sound it makes, or something like that, completely unaware of the fact that they might be rating it the way that they are because they're familiar with it, because they're around it all the time. They have to write it all the time. 
it's funny because as I read the study on that, uh, you know, finding, I kept thinking to myself, I really don't like the first initials of any of my names because all of them are kind of hard to handwrite. I mean, the letter J, I really had to work on how do you handwrite a letter J? And then G, I ultimately, which was my maiden name and now my middle name, G, I really, as a kid, had to figure out how do you write an upper case G in cursive? And I ultimately came up with a, um, a, a, a solution that um, is not normal way to write a G. I mean, I don't, I don't really particularly like any of my <laughs> initials. So clearly there's idiosyncratic differences. So you may not like your, your initials per se, but on average, people rate their initials higher than other letters of the alphabet. And we could attribute that to, to familiarity. So um, now, Similarity. I also have a little handout that I do in class where we do a self rating. And one of the things that we find is that in um, attraction, a lot of times people are attracted to people who are similar to them, similar on age, similar on um, socioeconomic status, similar to them on um, level of attractiveness. Um, these kinds of things. People tend to come together based on these kinds of things. And uh, so it's kind of almost like a little bit self-serving because here's a person who maybe kind of looks like me and I find that attractive, right? Like why would that work? Well, because of again, familiarity, right? People who have features that are similar to ours um, or to our, to our sibling or, you know, to other people in our family that we're familiar with, people who have similarities to that um, feel familiar, right? And familiarity breeds attraction. So um, I'm not suggesting that we find our brothers or our sisters attractive. I'm saying that people who kind of look like them might be extra attractive to us. Now, the phantom other technique is our tendency to um, sort of project ourselves onto a potential romantic partner. And so we want to find someone who's sort of like us. Um, we assume that a person who we find physically attractive probably is similar to us on a bunch of other things that they probably agree with us on things, um, that they probably value what we value, things like that. I just picked a random face off the internet, by the way, for this picture. I don't know who this is. Um, the matching pr principle really refers to the idea that we tend to find people who sort of match us on a lot of qualities, right? That are about, you know how we have that phrase that a person might be out of our league, what we're referring to is that you don't match on the things that, that observers think are important for you to match on, right? Um, that person's too good looking or too rich or too successful or whatever we mean by they're out of your league, right? Um, basically, us humans follow this matching principle where we find people who are sort of at our level in general. A lot of times when you see a person who is substantially less attractive than their partner, we make some assumptions about what that less attractive person probably brings to the relationship that makes the substantially more attractive person interested in that, in that less attractive person or vice versa. We think, well, that person might be really attractive, but what else are they lacking that this is the, you know, person that they were able to attract as a romantic partner? Like maybe they're lacking in personality or maybe they're mean or, you know, other kinds of things. So the matching principle says that we tend to settle down with friends and with romantic partners who match us. They're basically at our same level. You might notice that when you see a group of people who are with just their friends, that there's a lot of matching going on with those friends. Um, one of the things that actually can break up friendships is when um, one or, or more of the members of the group start to move on to another level of life, right? Like maybe we were friends because of high school or college, and then people start getting married or having children and suddenly we're not matching anymore. And now we sort of drift away. We're not matching on some really big, important things. Um, so that's what we're talking about with the matching principle is this idea of, of having romantic partners that are sort of at our same level. Um, so I will find the correct URL for this video and put it into the playlist so you can watch the matching principle in action.